Hi, everybody. This is Pastor Alex Lepos of the House, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. We are tonight in Hebrews chapter 12. We just had an accident somehow. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, Hebrews chapter 12, which is actually a continuation of Hebrews chapter 11. It's a supplement to Hebrews chapter 11. And to begin, I'm going to ask Caroline to open up in prayer. Caroline, would you pray, please? Father, we thank you for this evening, Lord. We welcome your presence. We welcome your word. And we thank you for Pastor Alex and what he's prepared, Lord. We pray that you would speak through him. We pray, Lord, that every distraction would be laid aside. Thank you for the reminder tonight, Lord, especially in the song, of how powerful you are, how your name alone can make a big difference how your name has power. There's no other name than your name, Lord. So we glorify you this evening. We're here for you, oh God. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Let us just review why Hebrews was written. Hebrews was written by an unknown author. We don't know who it was, although in my mind, I have suspicion that it was Paul with the help of Apollos, because Paul knew everything about the Old Covenant and the Old Covenant Levitical sacrifices more than anybody. And Apollos was an expert in Greek because the Greek of Hebrews is extremely highfalutin and very sophisticated. And so they probably collaborated on writing Hebrews, uh, the entire book. And it was written for two reasons. Number one, to show that the New Covenant is superior to the Old Covenant. Number two, to encourage the Hebrew believers to persevere through persecution, which way they were facing on a tremendous level. And so Hebrews 12 connects their persecution and their trouble with the new covenant. And that should be an encouragement to, an encouragement to them. We're going to look at uh, Hebrews chapter 12 right now. But before we do, let's remind ourselves that it is a supplement to Hebrews chapter 11, which is known as the faith chapter. So if you remember Hebrews chapter 11, there were definite examples of faith, different men, different women that were mentioned in that particular chapter to demonstrate what faith, what action taken in faith or faith uh, leading to action looks like. And so these are the witnesses that Hebrews 12 refers to. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, what witnesses? Well, the witnesses that we read about in Hebrews chapter 11, a lot of people or some parts of the Christian uh, world take that scripture and mean that there are there is an unseen church of saints, which is true. There is an unseen church of saints, but somehow it's connected to the church down here and that certain saints and holy individuals can be prayed to as mediators between man and God. But what the cloud of witnesses actually refers to in Hebrews chapter 12 is the cloud of witnesses that we read about in Hebrews chapter 11. So therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, when the writer of Hebrews mentioned laying aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and running the race with endurance, he had in mind the Greek golden apple race. Let me explain that to you. Every year, Greek athletes got together in the stadium, which is still in Athens, by the way, it's still standing, and they had a tremendous race. And on the way, during the course of that race, were placed golden apples, like you see here, solid gold apples, on the way, that were laid down as distractions to keep them from winning the race. And uh, the key was not to pick up the golden apples as you got to them. They were also held by beautiful women. So there were all kinds of distractions and temptations on the way of that race. And the winner was usually the one who ignored the apples and ignored the women and just set their sights straight on the finish line and uh, did not get sucked in by the distractions, as you see this individual here being sucked in. This one here is ignoring them and moving on. It would be kind of hard to do. So this is what Hebrews refers to when it says to lay aside every weight. Don't pick up the golden apple of sin. Don't give in to the sin which so easily ensnares you. Don't give in to the passions of the flesh, because these are like golden apples preventing you from finishing the race. Or hindering you from finishing the race effectively and that's what that particular uh, those particular verses refer to now the example of the witnesses referred to in hebrews 11 the examples of the witnesses are many but i've just chosen a few and i've put some slogans beside their name 
to uh, kind of describe or to give a headline to their type, the type of faith that they displayed. So we see that Enoch was mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. And Enoch's testimony was, though none go with me. Enoch lived in a time when hardly anybody served God. He was one of the few, probably the only one that served God. And if you remember, the Lord translated him into heaven physically, bodily, uh, which was a privilege that he gave no one else except Elijah in the old covenant. So Enoch's testimony is, though none go with me, still I will follow. Then there was Abel. And Abel's slogan or Abel's theme is God's way and no other way. Because God had required sacrifices to be given by his people. And I think that by that time, by the time of Abel, it was well established that the sacrifices that God wanted were animal sacrifices. And uh, and that's what Abel gave God. Abel gave God exactly what he required, exactly what he asked for, to make restitution for his sins and to have an acceptable sacrifice. Cain, on the other hand, offered vegetables. Now, I don't know, uh, I, I'm not going to get into why Cain was rejected, but God's way was animal sacrifices and not the sacrifices of, of vegetables. So Abel's slogan is God's way and no other way. Then there was Noah. Noah protected his loved ones by faith, by building the ark. He worked on the ark for 150 years. That's a long time to build a boat of that size. And all that time, he invited the people around him to join him in the ark to be protected from the floods that were coming. But he was marked and ridiculed for the most part because nobody believed that it would rain in the way that he said. Because in that time, the earth was watered by underground springs. It was not watered by rain. Rain was something unknown. But Noah believed God. And so he built the ark. And in the process of building the ark, he built a protection for his loved ones by faith. He believed God. And he built the ark. And people were his people, his uh, close ones, his, his loved ones were able to enter the ark and be protected by the flood. Then there's Abraham, whose slogan is, I will follow him wherever he leads. Do you remember Abraham was called out of the Ur of the Chaldees, out of his father's house, and to go to a land which God would show him. But Abraham had no idea where that land was. But because he believed God that he would be the father of many nations, he followed the Lord's leading wherever the Lord would lead him. And most of his life, almost his entire life, Abraham had no idea where God was taking him. But that's what faith does. Faith follows the Lord wherever he will, will lead without any conditions. And then there was Moses who showed faith by the slogan that Jesus is worth more than the world. You remember last week we read that Moses loved the Lord, the reproach of Jesus, more than the riches and the glory of Egypt, which is incredible because the reproach of Jesus is a painful thing. It's a difficult thing. It's nothing glamorous. There's nothing exciting about it. It can be full of suffering and torment. But the thing that you gain through going through all of that is a relationship with God. And as far as Moses was concerned, the relationship with God was worth much more than anything that Egypt could offer. So that's another type of faith, another action taken because of faith. And then finally, there was Joseph who had his eye on the final destination. If you remember, Joseph asked that his bones be buried in the promised land. Now, Joseph was second in command in all of Egypt. And he had been a ruler in Egypt for quite some time, second only to Pharaoh. And for him to tell the children of Israel before they would be delivered, which was many, 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 many years later, Joseph showed a tremendous amount of faith because he knew that God would restore his people back to their land. And as a result, he also knew as a result that he would not be a part of that. He would die beforehand. So he asked that his bones be taken to the promised land and buried there. But all his life, Joseph had an eye on the people of God's final destination, like we should when we think about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and live our lives accordingly. Now, these are all specific acts of faith, but Hebrews gives us a general principle of faith that can help us in every specific, you know, specific situation. So what is that general principle? Well, here it is in verse two. The general principle of faith is to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, take note of that, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God. Here's a great artist's depiction of somebody looking to Jesus as he's going through tribulation, looking to Jesus as his example, as his source of strength. Hebrews continues by saying, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. 
you have not yet resisted to bloodshed striving against sin and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons that's a very interesting verse a couple of a couple of very interesting verses there because they tell us some things that some christians today find hard to accept and what they tell us is is that in the christian life yes there will be trouble jesus said in the world you will have tribulation but be of good cheer i have overcome the world it also tells us that the christian life is a life of adversity because jesus said as the world hates him so they will hate us and because we are christians oftentimes we will be persecuted simply for the reason that we have faith in christ the world has no interest in jesus no regard for the lord and no regard for the people that that follow him and then there's discouragement because it hears says here not to be discouraged in our souls so we can be sure discouragement will come why would discouragement come because it's going to be hard times and the last thing that it's that it tells us to do is to remember jesus and i think that verse um the underlying message of that verse is to accept the hard parts of the christian life the christian life is not easy the christian life is a difficult life and it would be much easier for us and easier for the hebrews to whom this was written to just accept the fact that the christian life is not like the old covenant which promised prosperity at all times and peace at all times but there is an adverse part of the christian life and that is to suffer and to be conformed to the sufferings of the lord jesus christ so my first question today is what are some of the things that make following jesus difficult and let's give that one to jeffrey what are some of the things jeffrey that make following jesus difficult Hmm. There are many things. I guess it is um, thinking self gratification that we have to put Christ first. Be, be, uh, he Jesus takes first place in our lives. Okay. Uh, we put that before anything else, our own needs, for example. Why is that difficult? Why? Because we are, we are, as, we are, we are also looking out for number one, for our own needs as human beings. Okay, so Oliver, why is it difficult to follow Jesus? Well, the world we live in is totally anti-Jesus. Yes, that's right. We are, we're going to be persecuted by the police. We're going to be persecuted by the government. We're going to be persecuted by the street people. We're going to be persecuted by the gays, by the transgenders. We're going to be persecuted by other religions, by the Seventh-day Adventists. Yep. We're going to be persecuted by everybody, by our own fathers. <laughs> right. Yeah. Hey. Christina, as far as you're concerned, what makes following Jesus difficult? Um, what came to my mind was timing. You know, as an unbeliever, you're just concerned with fulfilling your desires now uh, making things happen but as a believer you're more concerned with pleasing the father and being on his timetable and his time clock and in our flesh it's very hard to wait sometimes um, for certain promises to take place in our life so i guess in that sense sometimes it could be difficult May following I, jesus i would agree with that okay what about you joseph what makes following jesus difficult in your mind That would be for Joseph. I think it's uh, it's a case of um, some people find it hard to uh, agree with um, with Jesus. Okay, just in, in general, the a lot of people don't like his uh, rules, uh, the rules and the regulations. And uh, it's for them. It's just um, it's just impossible to to live uh, that kind of life. So therefore, like believers like you and me, I feel it's just you know like uh, we are not going to be in agreement, however, whatsoever, with this so-called um, anti antichrist or anti Jesus uh, movement. Right. So, like, it's a case of uh, 
you and me against the world. Okay. The following verses, the ones that are following, the ones that we're going to read now, speak of God's involvement in your life. And that comes with its own challenges. And what could these challenges be? I'm not going to ask you the question, but I think that in expressing why it's difficult to follow Jesus, sometimes we have the answer of why it's a challenge to have God's involvement in your life, because he's constantly watching. He's constantly correcting. He's constantly working in our lives. And he has an agenda for each one of us that he wants to fulfill according to the degree to which we're willing to yield to him. So one of the most difficult challenges is that of correction, correction by the hand of God, which could come in various ways and is sure to come. We're going to be corrected as Christians. There's no question about that because we need to remember that none of us are perfect and that correction is inevitable. So my next question is, how can God's correction come? What are some of the ways that God's correction comes to our lives? Kofi. Conviction by his spirit. Conviction by his spirit. Can you explain a little bit? Uh, so, I mean, if you have a relationship with Christ, um, you, you, are, you are able to hear the voice of the Lord through the Holy Spirit. Right. Um, when you begin to veer off, or when you're walking in error, the Spirit of God will convict you um, and remind you of uh, the commandments of Christ, as uh, Jesus and, uh, uh, taught his disciples, okay. and bring you back or lead you back into the will of God. Okay, and Caroline, I've, many times I've heard from pulpits all over the world that conviction, the conviction of the Holy Spirit is not the same as condemnation. Can you give me your ideas of what's the difference between conviction and condemnation, please? Caroline. Conviction is really the Lord's heart to bring a sinner either to come to know the Lord and to... to repent of their sins or a believer to change their ways that are being maybe disobedient to God's word. So God's heart is always to bring conviction in order to restore that relationship, in order to have that closeness and that Im intimacy again with the, the being that he created. Um, condemnation is about guilt. It's about shame. It doesn't offer any hope. So they're really two different things. And most of the time, condemnation comes from the enemy and conviction, as Kofi was saying, comes from the spirit. Okay. So that's the difference between conviction and condemnation. Let us move on. Verse 5. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God, God deals with you as sons. But what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which we are all partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. It's a very interesting passage because it tells me that the worst thing that could ever happen to you is if Jesus leaves you alone in your sin and never guides you and never corrects you. So knowing that, what should our attitude be when we are corrected by the Lord in some way? And I'll give that one to Judy. Judy, how what should our attitude be when, Lord, when the Lord corrects us? Uh, well, realize that he is correcting us, to be humble and to accept it as correction and to change. Okay, to... Well, great. that's great. Thank you. That's a good attitude. What about you, Lise? What do you think? What should our, should our attitude about the Lord's correction be? Okay, well, I'll let's ask someone else. How about John Cardos? What should our attitude of towards correction from the Lord be, John? Don't Sorry. forget to mute your mic. You gotta, you gotta turn on your microphone. Great comfort and great joy. Yes. Because at least he's there finally. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, that's good. At least he's in your life, right? Yeah. Great comfort and great joy. Wonderful. Okay. So furthermore, here's what it says in verse nine. We have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of our spirits and live? 
So verse 9 gives the suggestion that we should be happy when we're corrected because our Father loves us and is interested in our lives and cares enough to speak to us when we're off mark. For they indeed for a few days, that's earthly fathers speaking now, they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may partake, be partakers of his holiness. No chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So here's a nice artist depiction of gladly accepting God's correction. This is us, and this is the Lord, a loving father correcting his child. And that's basically what it is, a loving father correcting his child, which we are. So the proper attitude in the area of God's correction is number, five, number one, respect the fatherhood of God. Understand that God is our father and he will treat us like a father treats his children. He'll love us. He'll sustain us. He'll support us. He'll supply our needs. But when we need correction, he will be quick to correct us with love and with the view to restore us to proper living. Second thing is that we need to know that he corrects us for our good always. So no matter how painful it is, something wonderful is going to come out of it. We're going to be conformed to the image of Christ. And as a result of that, then correction should always be welcome, good, seen as good, and beneficial. I don't have to ask why, so I'll just take that out. We've answered that question. Verse 12 says, Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people, and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Now, that passage indicates to us that we have to dig deep, not to put God down, not to get angry at him when he does something painful to help us grow in Christ. Because when chastisement comes and pain begins to be inflicted and sorrow begins to overtake us, we can go either way. We can become bitter or we can become better. We can become resentful or we can be thankful. We can be weakened or we can be strengthened. And it's entirely our choice which way we're going to go. And I've seen some people become so bitter that they actually turn their backs on God, turn their backs on the church. And I've seen other people get better. And the whole purpose of Hebrews chapter 12 up until this point is to encourage people to persevere in the Lord so they can be better. And to understand that when chastisement comes, when persecution, when persecution comes, when suffering comes, it conforms us to the sufferings of Christ and gives him an opportunity to really work in our hearts and conform us to his image. So my next question is, how can we make the choices that strengthen us rather than weaken us? Justin, how can we make the choices that strengthen us rather than weaken us? What do we do? Um, well, we have to be obedient to his word. Okay, be obedient to his word. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, Oliver, what can we do to make sure that uh, suffering doesn't tear us down but builds us up? What can we do? Love him more by, by, by reading more of his word, praying more, by fellowshipping more, by worshiping more, by evangelizing more. Okay, so you're saying the five pillars of the Christian life. Pour your soul into the more. Okay, Amen. what about you, Christina? How can we strengthen ourselves? What choices can we make to strengthen ourselves rather than weaken ourselves when chastisement comes? Um, well, on your um, PowerPoint, it says something about, like, instead of, I think, resentment or instead of bitterness, like having thankfulness. Oh, you mean here? Right here? Um. Yeah. Yeah. So when you were reading that, the thing that came to mind, just on a personal note, um, you know, I could be really upset, like, oh, Lord, you know, I've been doing everything right, you know, and I'm still waiting for all of this stuff. And um, one of the things I'm still waiting on is for the, the gift of a husband, you know, and I could be really bitter and angry and blah, blah, blah. But obviously I'm not. But just to say that it could be. But instead, you're thankful for his protection and he knows best, you know, he, he's absolutely in control of that. Okay. So that's, fine. that's great. Thank you very much. Let's move on to verse 15. 
more instruction on how to deal with the chastisement that comes with difficulties that come with sorrows which may overwhelm. <coughs> Look carefully, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness bringing up causes trouble. There is how you fall short of the grace of God right here. When you let a root of bitterness set into your heart because you are accusing God of not performing when he could easily accuse you of not performing. You put yourself under the law when you do that. And by this, it says, many people become defiled. And the whole purpose of Hebrews was to get people away from old covenant thinking. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. This is very interesting, if you know the story of Esau, because bitterness can lead to lethal decisions. And that's what happened in the life of Esau. He made a bad decision to sell his inheritance to Jacob for a bowl of soup. Why? Because he had just come in from hunting and he was tired and he was hungry. And at that moment, hunger meant more to him than his relationship with God and the inheritance that would come through his father, Isaac. However, this teaches us a lesson. And the lesson is, if Jesus is the most valuable thing in your life, you will never let go of him no matter what happens to you. And this is where faith comes in. Faith enables you not to be bitter. So, Caroline, how can faith fight bitterness, disappointment, and other things? How can faith fight bitterness and disappointment? Caroline. Um, well, when you have faith, first of all, your eyes are on Jesus. Yeah. And so you, you're you already looking at the person who can provide the solution, who can create the breakthrough. So it also starts to bring up a certain amount of joy because you're looking at the one who holds the power. You're also looking at the one who loves you the most, who has your best interest at heart. Right. And so you know that, that even though what you're going through is tough, it's it's ultimately going to be okay and it's going to be good because God is the one who is in control. And you also, when you're in faith, I find a lot of people who are in faith are also the ones that are standing on God's word. So standing on his word, you can't you can't have a heart that's bitter and having a heart that is in faith. If you're thinking about the word of God and his promises, then that also brings joy, that also brings hope. And uh, there's no place for bitterness in that. Okay, but if you remember, a general principle of faith was given to us a way back here, which is looking up to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God. We know that the faith of Jesus, the faith he gives us, will help us to endure anything because he himself endured the cross and was able to overcome death through his resurrection and was able to send us the Holy Spirit when he sat down at the right throne at the right hand of the throne of God. And so Jesus is our example of faith and our source of faith and the strength of our faith and the substance of our faith, because the faith, the conviction, the resolve that he had is given to us to be able to endure in sufferings. And that is available to us only in the new covenant, which brings us to our next point. Let's go back down here. Uh, before we get into the two covenants, however, I have one more question, and that is what might what might cause someone to give up on Jesus? And it's in verses 16 and 17. We'll just review that. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who here it is for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterwards, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Esau sold out on God. For a morsel of food. People have been selling out on God for a little bit more than that, but certainly less than what Jesus is worth. Absolutely. Judas sold out on God for 30 pieces of silver. People sell out on God for career. People sell out on God for business. People sell out on God to acquire a relationship with somebody who they should not be with. There's all kinds of reasons why people sell out on Jesus. And uh, Hebrews is encouraging them not to sell out on Jesus no matter what happens, which is why they refer to the two covenants of God. They compare the two covenants of God because the two covenants of God have a great effect on our walk with God. 
Now remember, the Hebrew Christians were suffering, and they were also battling with the prospect of which covenant was better. People were teaching at that time that you have to follow the law of Moses to be saved, as well as believe in Jesus. But the writer of Hebrews made the contention that, no, you don't need the law. The law is a problem. The law is a hindrance. The law will not help you in your walk with God. The new covenant is simply having faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, faith in Jesus to answer your prayers when you go before the throne of God to find mercy and grace in a time of need, which is in Hebrews chapter 4. Faith in Jesus to be the all-sufficient sacrifice that covers all of your sins. Faith in Jesus to lead you into the Holy of Holies, the intimate place with God, where you can have fellowship and communion with God the Father. And that will help you greatly in working through the sufferings and the sorrow and the adversity of this life. And that's why the two covenants are now compared after all these words on faith were given. So let's look at the old covenant. Here's what Hebrews says. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and burned with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged it that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure what was commanded. For if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. So terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. What was the writer of Hebrews trying to convey by saying this? He was conveying this. That God gave you laws under the old covenant, but since you can't keep those laws, he stands against you as an enemy. Now, can you imagine if that is your state, dealing with adversity, dealing with pain, dealing with sorrow, understanding that God is your enemy because you can't keep his law? And that's what the point that the Hebrew, the writer of the Hebrews was trying to make, that that covenant does not help you in adversity, does not help you with trouble does not really help you in any way, shape, or form, which is why he then goes into the new covenant. You have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that is the blood of Jesus, that speaks better things than that of Abel. The blood of Jesus screamed and cried out and pleaded for forgiveness of sin. And the blood of Abel screamed and pleaded and cried out for revenge. Now that covenant, this covenant here, the new covenant, is best explained by Romans 8, beginning at verse 31. Here's a summary, a synopsis of the new covenant and what we can expect. What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who brings a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ, shall tribulation or distress. Now here's the important part, because the Hebrews were going through this stuff. So shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written. For your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Here we go. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that establishes the superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant. So that's why the writer of Hebrews ends with this particular passage where he says, see to it then that you do not refuse him who speaks. Well, what is he saying to us? <coughs> Excuse me. What is he who is speaking saying to us? He's saying to us, put your hope in the new covenant, not the old covenant, not the covenant of law, not the covenant of failed performance, not the covenant of wrath and enmity towards God and God towards you. Put your confidence in the new covenant. For if they did not escape him who refused, uh, therefore that if they not escape who refused him who spoke on the earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised saying, 
Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. Know this. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of all these things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, and the things which cannot be shaken, may, so that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably, acceptably, with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire, and that is the essence of the new covenant. We are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Therefore, we cannot be shaken. We cannot be moved. We cannot be overcome. We cannot be defeated because the kingdom of God is stronger than anything the world can throw at us, anything the devil might use to attack us, anything that our own flesh may testify against. We are citizens of the kingdom, and the kingdom is in us through the presence of the Holy Spirit by the new covenant because of faith and because of the grace that causes us to have that faith. Let us have grace by which we serve God acceptably, reverence and godly fear. And so that summarizes Hebrews chapter 11 and Hebrews chapter 12. We live under a better covenant, a new covenant, which helps us to endure and to be encouraged when we go through sufferings because God is on our side and Jesus is with us and the spirit of God is in us. Therefore, we always have the victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you all for listening. I'm going to ask Kofi to close in prayer. In prayer. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks and praise for your word. We thank you for the depth of revelation that you have brought us tonight. We thank you, Father, that you've given us the gift of faith, that you've given us an opportunity to partake of something greater, a greater and better covenant to participate um, in your purpose of fulfilling faith. I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, even as you are the author and finisher of our faith, I pray, Father, that you will lead us um, and bring us to the expected end that you have planned and purpose for each and every one of us. I pray that we will grow in faith, grow in understanding. I pray, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus right now, that if there be any weight, if there be any besetting sin, if there be any condition or circumstance that slows us down, that bogs us down, that keeps us um, out of pace with the pace of the Spirit of God leading us in our lives, I pray that whatever it may be, it be removed right now in the name of Jesus. And I pray, Father, that everyone here tonight will be free to experience your grace to the fullest. We'll be free, Father, to experience the good and perfect gifts that you have for us. In the name of Jesus, I pray, O oh God, for a freedom and liberation to serve you with all our hearts, with all our souls, our minds, our strength. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray for our pastor and his family. We pray for health. We pray for strength. We pray for wealth. We pray for peace. We pray for love for him and his household. In Jesus' mighty name, and we pray, O oh God, for our assembly, that you continue to bless us and lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And on Sunday morning, this Bible study will be further supplemented by Kofi's message on the all-sufficient Christ. So God bless you. See you then. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, brethren. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Bless you. Bless you.